just announced a, an upgrade in the resource up to 2.4 million tonnes of contained copper. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the background of that resource in the, in the later slides. But that puts us now as the largest undeveloped copper resource in Australia. Um, at the higher cutoff of two point, uh, of, uh, um, that we used previously on the 0.15, that would have been, uh, we'd still be in the second largest undeveloped in the, in the country. It's only a couple of hours north of Perth, and um, near what then near the, near the town of Hornet Hills. Um, it's in an area that no one's produced, traditionally associated with uh, fighting copper. So it's been uh, off the radar for a lot of companies. It was done by the Union about uh, six, seven years ago as the first resource published, and then it was developed initially by First Quantum Minerals in um, joint venture with Caravel, and then uh, we've been developing it to the next stage over the last three years. It's got a lot of very special attributes, which is why well, we were attracted to the project when we got involved. The location been the key one, uh, but the access to the existing infrastructure is a huge asset for these types of projects, and um, substantially reduces your, your operating risk and your, and your capital cost. Um, I think we've got some of these things later on. The, um, the other advantages that have been touched on by some of the other uh, people speaking today, uh, Dave Franklin mentioned that one of the emerging themes is the, the uh, political risk that's um, plaguing a lot of large developments, particularly in South America and, and Africa. Um, we're happy to be in an area where we don't experience too many of those problems at all. Free old land, native titles been settled, and, um, and we get on well with our neighbours. The, uh, the, one of the things that's happened in the last, well, just in the last couple of weeks, months, is a, another world class <coughs> discovery was announced in this area of Goneville deposit, Chulamar with Chalice. It, it sort of happened in a way that not many people would realise, but there's now three world class ore bodies sitting in the southwest of Western Australia. Um, the Greenbush is lithium mine out in the south, Boddington Gold Mine, largest, in Australia, largest gold mine in Australia, one of the top gold mines in the world, I think number six. And, uh, and Goneville is a deposit. Um, Caravel is not quite up there with uh, some of the, uh, the big copper ore bodies, but we're in good company. Um, there's, a, there's a story behind all of that. These are all Archean deposits. They're all within a, a relatively short uh, space of time. They've all been formed. And uh, it's a really interesting emerging story that we're right in the thick of. And it's a, it's a story for another day, but it's something I'm sure you'll hear more about later. The details we'll talk about a little bit today are based on the 2021 scoping study we just released uh, last month, or early this month. Um, that was based on the previous resource. So uh, that study, um, the resource used in that study was uh, about a million tonnes less contained copper. It was published in 2019. Uh, but even basing the, um, even on the old resource, the, uh, the new study found we had an NPV of around 1.4 billion. And that was a, the reason we updated that study was to factor in a lot of the increased costs that the industry has seen lately, particularly labour materials, which have gone up quite substantially. There's significant upside from where this study is now, and that's what we're focused on in the PFS, which will be completed early next year. Um, there's upside in the resource, there's a higher grade in the shallower parts that we'll bring in in the mine planning, and, um, and there's opportunities for some further cost reductions. The key to a project like Caravel's scale and simplicity. Um, I've been involved in lots of smaller projects and, and various types of projects, and I'm sure anyone who has been through developments knows that there's usually just one or two things that take up most of your time. And it depends on where you are, what they are. You know, they might be social things, they might be technical things. The beauty of this project is that technically it's extremely simple. It's bulk, conventional lab and pit mining, large scale mining, we're using large equipment. We've got the opportunity to take advantage of all of the things that are going on in that, in that bulk mining, particularly around autonomy and electrification, which I'll talk about a little bit in the, in the moment. And many of those things have been pioneered here at WA. Um, the, Simplicity, the resource model is relatively straightforward. We've now been able to convert over 100 million tonnes into measured, you know, which will come into the first five years of my life. So the resource risk now is very low. Metallurgy is extremely simple. Um, possibly because this project, or because this ore body has gone through a uh, uh, granulite facies metamorphism, it's made all of the copper very amenable to high recoveries. So we get high 90s in the rougher, 
and then we clean that up into the low 90s recoveries. That's, a, that's essential for these types of lighter grade ore bodies. Very standard processing flow sheet, nothing unusual about it. And um, importantly, we're on the grid in the you know, southwest grid, so we get very cheap power relative to being a standalone project. Um, our, all of our logistics and other issues that associated with servicing a large project like this is very simple. We're on a, a heavy haulage road that, that runs up, run, runs straight past the, uh, the mine gate down to Bunbury, where, the, uh, where we'll be exporting from, and uh, and we produce a very high quality concentrate with very very low levels of impurities. So it makes it very marketable and very sought after. Um, and importantly, the uh, the tails and the waste. There's no acid mine generation out of these materials. Starting off with a low sulfide content has some advantages. We take out virtually everything uh, in the uh, process of making concentrate. So we have very minimal environmental issues, both in the, in the, due to the location and due to the nature of the ore body. That all adds up to a, a cost structure that's very competitive, under $2, around $1.90 a pound, um, which gives very good margins and good prices, and, uh, and, and a fast payback. A lot of people would be surprised how you can get that type of low cost structure off a low grade mine, and that's one of the, I think that's one of the things that's often misunderstood. Although these types of mines are very common overseas, around 0.3 copper is the average grade mined in North America in all the mines there at the moment. So this is exactly like what's being done very commonly outside of Australia, and those mines are making very good money, particularly at the moment. Oops. That's just a quick breakdown. I just want to talk a couple of slides on cost. The because um, it is it is the first question everyone asks when you say we well, mine an ore body at point three. I guess if you're a sandfire investor, you probably think that's a geochemical anomaly. And and yet sandfire reports a cost of a dollar a pound, um, and we're reporting two dollars a pound. But we don't have to spend the money on exploration and development, and sustaining capital. Which, if you look at a lot of these high-grade underground operations almost doubles those operating costs and gets them up close to where we are. Needless to say, when you've got a billion tonnes of resource, you're not going to be spending a lot of money on exploration every year trying to replace it. There's 30 years mining ahead of us before we need to replace it. And then there's a lot of opportunities to do that, but it won't be a very substantial spend. And the capital is mostly up front. The sustaining capital is very low compared to these high-grade underground operations. So they can be very competitive. And mining costs break down pretty evenly between uh, the mine and the process plant. And um, there's two things in particular to note there. Power on the process side, biggest component of processing, and on the mining side, the strip ratio um, is the biggest thing. I've shown strip ratio as a proportion of cost based on the life of mine, one to one, 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 to one. In the first five years, it's half that, 0.5 to one. So when you think about the sensitivities of those two things, if we weren't on the grid, and we we're out burning diesel or whatever to um, generate our power, our power costs would be three times as high. And if we had a strip ratio of three to one, which would still be considered quite low, our mining costs would be twice as high. So those sensitivities have a huge impact. It would double our cost nearly if we were looking at something like that, which would still be considered a conventional mine. So that's what, that's what drives very low cost. Location being on the grid and very low waste to water ratios. In the future, uh, the thing about where mining is going at the moment, um, there's a lot of technology going in this thing. These areas are changing so fast. Our, um, our guys working on the mining model are having meetings with people, and you don't want to be on the bleeding edge, but they're, having, they're getting presented opportunities that you didn't exist five years ago, particularly around what's called now the ACE, um, automation, communication, electrification. These are the big things that are changing, particularly in open pit bulk mining. Automation is obviously taking a lot of people out of the workforce, but it's moving them into these high skilled, high paid jobs, and um, it's making it much more attractive in terms of the workforce attraction to come and work in a project like this, and it's driving down costs. The numbers of people involved in the fully automated scenario, which we expect will become our base case, it will be about 30% of a conventional mining operation. That has a huge impact on the costs, has a huge impact on your risks. And, uh, and it means that you can attract the very best people because you're offering them a higher paid, much more flexible job. Possibly one of their shifts will be in the city, one at the mine, one off. So you're, you're really changing the way mining operations work. On the um, electrification, because we're on the grid, uh, there's now a very 
um, stable, well mature options for going to uh, grid electrification for the haulage fleet. Um, batteries are part of that, but may not be a may not. We're not sure if they're going to be ready in time for what we want to do. But overhead trolley assist, uh, which is widely used in Africa and Scandinavia, is definitely going to be part of it. And that has a huge impact. Again, that will drive costs down further. Substituting diesel for electricity and reducing emissions. Um, it has a huge impact on other things too. The uh, maintenance requirements on these trucks are much lower. Speed of them is much faster. They go up the wall ramp three times quicker than a conventional truck. So you have less trucks in your fleet. We think the capital cost is actually not going to be substantially different because you take a number of trucks out of your fleet and that pays for all of the overhead electrification. So those are very exciting things to be to have in our in our project. Uh, just talking about the um, resource, it's grown steadily. It's doubled over the last five to six years since we made the resource. Um, that's just a function of drill. We expect that to continue. It's also partly though we've started to get a better understanding of the ore body. Um, a big change was when we realised that it's a the, the two limbs of the ore body are actually a fold, uh, folded over on top of each other. This is all part of the the old history of this project that formed as a porphyry two point um, nine billion years ago, and they've got caught up in a Himalayan style mountain building event that smashed it and folded it. By folding it over, it gave us two things. It doubled up the limbs so that the pits drive deeper. Those are the old 2019 pits. The new pits go substantially deeper again. Um, and it also seems to have not only recrystallized and made the ore better metallurgically, but it's, it's squeezed it into some high grade zones. So we're, we're focused on taking in all of it as a bulk mining operation. But if you look at the grades, and sorry, it's a bit small to read, but in that infill drilling on the top right hand section there, all of those grades are up in the uh, above 0.35, many of them are 0.4s. So they're substantially higher than the resource grade. The other thing to note is 150 metre continuous <coughs> intersections, sometimes more, and there's no gaps. That's just a big slab of ore in the hinge zone. So that's why the strip ratio is so low, and you can get in there, bulk mine it, not worried about dilution, not worried about uh, moving a lot of waste. Um, the other thing to note in the bottom right hand, or the bottom two, the deeper drilling is now seen that there's another limb heading off to the east. Um, we haven't got any drilling out in that area. There's a couple of shallow holes, but there's no deep ones. So as we understand the geology of this project, we start seeing more and more opportunities to keep chasing it. And that's something we can apply more widely. There's a 30 kilometer tri strike length for mineralization um, that the Bindi deposit forms part of. So Bindi's about two thirds of the way up there. Dash is the other uh, large deposit. There's a couple of hundred million tonnes at Dasher, and um, it used to be about a third of the resources now. It's less now because we've been focused at Bindi, but I think there's every opportunity to substantially upgrade Dasher in terms of tonnage. And there's high grade zones all through this area too now that we now recognise are associated with fold closures. So we're going to do more work targeting some of those fold closures, see if we can bring some high grade tonnes into the early schedule. There's not much point trying to find a lot more of the same tons because they'd be sitting 30 plus years out in the mine schedule. So timeline to final decision on this project is uh, into 2024 and then about an 18 month, two year construction period. Um, right now we're focused on the PFS to be completed early next year. So there's a lot of activities going on right now. We're on schedule, things are moving along well. And um, the resource today is a key milestone on that. The mine planning's now in full gear, and um, that PFS will come out probably. The work will be largely complete by the end of the year, but it'll probably be reported by January, sometime in February. Thank you very much.